So it is uh, called uh, the traveling salesman problem, and you're probably already aware of it. Uh, you, you might have heard of it before, but the idea is you basically have like a graph. Uh, and you know, you don't have to know that much about graphs to really understand this problem. Uh, but the point is like, let's say these represent cities and they're like these roads between cities. So you know, we can assume that the roads are bi-directional or we can ask a directed version of this problem where you know, some of the roads can be one way. It doesn't really matter that much right now. But you know, the point is, is that like, there's like these like, what we call vertices, which are, you know, say that they represent cities. And there are these edges, which are basically like roads between cities. And they may be interconnected in complex and somewhat redundant ways. Um, and the idea is that every road has like basically a cost of traveling on it. So like maybe like 10 or, you know, like every road has like some cost. It doesn't, it's not necessarily like a Euclidean distance or anything like that. You can't assume like necessarily uh, triangle inequality or anything like that because maybe, you know, maybe some road has a high cost because it's like either really slow or like maybe you have to pay a toll, who knows, right? Uh, this, these are just kind of abstract costs. The cost just represents some kind of preference that you have of like the kind of like the personal expense to you, whether it's financial or otherwise. And the goal is basically visit each city exactly once while minimizing your cost. So how do you do this problem? Well, the, the main trick here, like it's, it's really kind of easy once you figure out the trick. Um, like you, you just have to figure out like what is like the history you have to capture. Probably the hardest thing about the problem, but I sort of gave a hint about that in the problem statement, so I guess it wasn't that hard, uh, is like kind of, you might think that you might see the solution and then think that it can't be the solution because you should find something better and then you won't find anything better. Uh, so, first of all, what is the naive solution? The naive solution is some kind of like DFS that tries, it's like DFS but not, not exactly DFS but just like, you know, backtracking solution, essentially. You basically try every combination and in the worst case this might take n factorial time because you might have to try every possible sequence. If all of these are interconnected, if everything is connected to everything else, there might be as many as n factorial different sequences to try. So, um, in, in that case, like if it's what's called a complete graph where everything is connected to everything else, uh, yeah, it actually is n factorial different sequences you have to try before you can settle on the solution. You can probably, in practice, substantially improve the running time by doing like certain heuristics. Like you can basically keep like some kind of bounding where like maybe if you can already see that your current solution is going to be worse no matter what happens, like the solution you're currently generating is going to be worse no matter what happens, then your already best found solution, you just immediately move on to the next permutation. Uh, so there might be some kind of like significant gains you can get by, you know, uh, kind of like doing the sort of like bounding of solutions. But those are kind of all heuristics and they may, may not work in every case. Uh, so the goal here is basically how can we get a solution that's better than n factorial? And the idea is that instead of getting n factorial, we will get an exponential time solution. We will get like 2 to the nth power. Which is still bad, but it's better. Uh, like 2 to the 32nd power is perhaps quite feasible, whereas 32 factorial is actually like very, you know, a very, very large number and not very feasible. Okay, uh, so how can we do this? Um, well, we have to figure out what kind of state we need to capture. So remember, the constraint is like, we have to visit every city exactly once, and you have to try to do it while minimizing the cost. So <clears throat> the output of the you know, function f we want to write is probably going to be the cost, because that's what we're trying to minimize. Uh, okay, and what is like the history? What is the state that you need to know? Well, clearly your current position, right? So you will need some like a node n that like n, n represents or let's call it v. V is like a vertex that represents your current position. It is like some unique number associated with each vertex, okay? Or maybe like a pointer to the vertex or whatever. It's like some value, maybe a memory address, maybe a unique number. <clears throat> and this is no different than what we did like dynamic programming on trees in one of the tutorial sessions. We used like the node of the tree as a parameter. You can totally do this, okay? So, so we need the current position, but we also need basically a complete history of all the places where we visited. So we essentially need this sort of like, uh, <coughs> um, 
well, yeah, let me call this node, and let me call, let me call um, this next argument, like, visit. Yeah, so, so visit, I want to confuse v with visit, so I'll call it n and visit. n is the current node, and visit is basically a map, or it, it, it can be any kind of structure, but it's basically something that for every node uh, it has a boolean as to whether you visit it or not. Either that, or think of just like a set of all your visited nodes. Yeah, let, let, let's, let's make it that. Let's make it a set of all your visited nodes. So then, to kind of give this uh, equation, so first of all, like, you know, just a quick analysis, like, if there are v vertices, this parameter is v, right? This is order v, but this one is 2 to the vf power. So we're going to have b times 2 to the vf power states. Wow, that's a lot of states. But at least it's better than v factorial. OK, so let's just write the equation for this. Uh, how, can we, how can we write this? Uh, so if we are at a current version, current vertex n, what we must do is we must pick some outbound neighbor, like some, we must pick some outbound edge that carries us to a neighbor that we have not visited before. So basically, what we must do is basically this. Uh, we have to we have to get the min. So so we will get the we will you know we, we, we have a number of choices right like basically our choices if we are some node currently and we have some outbound edges out of this node. Whichever one le leads to vertices that are not visited. So like let's say we have these three outbound edges, but this vertex has already been visited. We, then only these two are our choices. And we must pay this cost here. We must pay, you know, whatever cost is on the edge. Cost, like, uh, the, these are our two choices, and we basically take the best one out of them. So again, we will be a min, because we're looking for what is the best choice out of the choices that we have. So we will take a min. <coughs> and what will the min be over? It will be min over... You know, min over all outbound, it's, it's kind of long, min over all outbound edges from n, where all outbound edges e from n, where e not in visit. It's kind of a, kind of a mouthful, but you know, essentially what it means in implementation-wise is you will loop over all your outbound edges, and for each outbound edge, you will check that uh, uh, that that the destination node, destination of E, that the destination node of E is not in this visited set. So, so you know, if you have three edges, you will loop over all of them, and you will just just focus on the ones that you where where the edge leads to a vertex that has not been visited. If, if these are the three outbound edges, this vertex is visited, we will only go to the other two. So, so minimum over all outbound edges E that are outbound from N, where destination of E not in this visited set. So minimum over all of those. It, what, what happens if there are no such edges? Then you have to return like positive infinity, right? You have to return like an infinite cost. So that whatever call, whatever call you made to get here knows that this is like not an option. Um, and what is the like function we want to minimize here? Well, we will do like some uh, f of. Well, we will go to the destination of the edge, right? Our location will be updated to the destination of the edge. Uh, you know, I, maybe I should write it as like e dot destination uh, to just make it clear. This is a this is not really like a function you call. It's like a property of the edge. Like think of the edges as like a two tuple that have a destination and a weight attribute. Uh, so you will update your position to e dot destination, and you will update your uh, visited set. How will you update it? Well, you will basically just add this element. Visited plus, you know, E. A set containing just, you know, E. 
Okay. You will basically like union these two sets. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So 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 this will be the uh, the cost uh, of proceeding from that point. But then you also have to you know charge yourself for just the cost of going to that just the cost of going to that vertex, right? And so this will just be like e dot weight. Okay, and yeah, and that's pretty much that, that, that's pretty much it for this problem. Like this is the this is just the general case. You will have like v to two to the v states, and you will do min oh, like from each one. You will consider all the possible outbound edges that you're legally allowed to go to, and the cost from there will be this. And uh, you know the cost to go there will be this. So you will consider that, and you will consider that over all the possible choices, and. Uh, from there, you will, uh, you know, look at which one is the best decision. Uh, now, uh, how do we know that this recursion is non-circular? That's a good, you know, question to ask in more complicated recursions like this. Well, note that we're always adding to the visited set. So actually, not only is this recursion non-circular, but it's never even very deep. Because every, like, call of this recursion adds yet an another element to, to the set. That doesn't mean that the time complexity is not high, right? Recursion can be shallow, but if it, because it's very wide, it can still be, have a high time complexity. But we know that it's not circular. In fact, it's not even very deep because we're always adding elements to the set. What is the base case here? So the base case is just like everything is in our visited set. If everything is in our visited set, then uh, return zero because we have no further cost. And we've completed our goal. So, for example, if we are one vertex away from completing our goal, that means that, you know, this function will return zero, like as we visit that vertex, uh, and we will just be built for weight, which is right. If, like, if we are just, like, one, you know, one vertex away from completing our goal, then it's just the cost to, to go to that vertex. Uh, yeah, so, so this is actually all there is to this problem. Like, the time complexity analysis here is b times 2 to the b states. Uh, so what is like the cost per state? Well, you know, at most you loop over v vertices here. So uh, basically, states, the number of states, is order v times two to the v. Um, the time per state here is well, you loop over at most v entries, but then additionally, you have to do this kind of like uh, cocking the set and adding one element to it. Uh, so that might actually cost you another, like this set can have up to v elements, so that might cost you another order v. So it might be order v squared, but this is a good time to just look at a technique. Uh, it's kind of a hacky technique, but it's called bitmask DP, uh, bitmask dynamic programming. So basically uh, what this is, is like this idea that like when you have to encode a set, sometimes you can just encode it with an integer. Like th think of it this way, right? Uh, we're not going to run this algorithm on any kind of large data set anyway because of the extremely high time complexity, right? So let's say that we can assume safely in this algorithm that we will never run this on more than 64 vertices because 2 to the 64th power is already like a completely like extravagant number, right? So we, we can assume that this will not run on more than 64 vertices. We can make that like a precondition. Um, and then what we can do is to encode this set efficiently uh, what we can do is instead of like making it like a set, like a set of integers in a hash map or something, we can instead just encode it as an integer by like using the bits in a in a like 64-bit long. So think of like a 64-bit long. It has you know a bunch of bits, right? It has like 64 bits, and we can use bitwise operators to like individually set these bits, and we can just encode here. Like let's say we have 64 vertices. We can just take the 64-bit long and let the ith bit encode whether the ith vertex is visited. So we can basically encode this set using a single long integer, which makes this whole, you know, which makes this whole function kind of a lot easier because now you just have to think about passing around integers and not sets. <coughs> yeah. So here, what happens is like now, now this visited set is an integer. Uh, you know, it still has two to the v states, don't, don't get me wrong here, because, uh, you know, you still have every possible combination of the bits that it can set. 
Uh, but the difference is that you like if you just want to add an ed, you know you want to add. Um, well, this is actually e dot destination. It's not technically because this is a set of vertices, not edges. So so yeah, if you want to just add uh, like a new uh, vertex to it. Well, well, look. Like, let's say, let's say we only had four vertices, and it was like the, and our bits were like this. So that would just mean like the zero. Th this is like the zero first, second, third bit. That would just mean like the zero first. The zero vertex is unvisited. The first vertex is visited. The second vertex is visited. The third vertex is unvisited. Now, let's say you want to you want to add the third vertex as a visited thing. You just construct a bit mask that basically you do. You, you take you take one and you shift it by vertex number. This is like a left shift. So 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 you, at first you have one, but let's say the vertex number is three. That will generate a, a, that will generate a bit sequence like this. Then you take this bit sequence here, and now you do like a logical OR, and that creates this bit sequence, which is what you want. Uh, th that creates one 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 zero, which means that these see like all of these previous bits are preserved. But we've at, we've just set this bit at this position. So uh, you know the logic here basically becomes something like uh, take visited, and visited is now an integer. So uh, I call it I call it visit for short. Visit and then logically or that with one e dot destination. I'm assuming e dot destination here now is like a number. It's like a, it's the number of the vertex, and the numbers are like from zero to however many vertices minus one. We can now just kind of replace that like this, and you know what? what how does this help us? Well, I mean, it's just like a, a nice little trick to make things simpler, and also this operation can be considered order one. It's kind of you know it's kind of dumb to really consider this order one because. I mean, if you think about it, like it's not really, uh, because if you had more than 64 vertices, you would have to start using multiple integers. Uh, but if you kind of think of it as like, we're never going to run this on more than the number of, uh... <clears throat> I mean, for one, okay, for one, think of it this way, right? If you don't have, if you're running this, like this requires v times 2 to the v space anyway for the states, right? Because there's this many states. So this requires v times 2 to the v memory. Probably, like, you know, you're not going to have enough memory to have 2 to the 64th power of anything if you don't have 64-bit integers in whatever system you're using, right? Probably, like, the maximum size of, like, a primitive type in your system exceeds the 2 to the whatever, uh, you know, uh, well, if, if you take the maximum number of bits in the primitive type you have, like say like 64, and you take 2 to that power, 2 to the 64, that's almost certainly bigger than the amount of memory you have in your system. Because otherwise, how would you even address that memory, right? Uh, so, so, so if you kind of assume that like, you know, because, because this requires this much memory anyway, you will never run this on, uh, you know, say more than like 64, because this would require more memory than your system will ever have. Uh, you can think of this as, uh, running in order one, and then if this runs in order one, then time per state becomes order b, and now you reach a total time complexity of b squared to the b. So this algorithm, if I recall correctly, this algorithm was first given in, I believe, 1964, and uh, uh, it hasn't been substantially improved since. Uh, I think I actually read something about about the like um, just a couple of years ago. There was like some paper where like somebody actually I don't know if it's like in all cases or what, but they kind of like improved a little bit on this while it's still like exponential time. Uh, but yeah, I mean you know between 1964 and that that uh, time, nobody uh, found like a much better solution for this in the general case. Now, of course, you know, there's all kinds of like traveling salesman stuff where like if you have Euclidean distances, they have like some approximation algorithm that, you know, is provably within a certain bound or something. Um, maybe if like there's some like modified versions of the problem that admit some solution. But, you know, yeah, this result has like not been like substantially improved upon. Uh, and in fact, it's believed like the traveling salesman is uh, what's called NP complete. So it's believed that probably efficient solutions to it don't exist. 
But it's very nice to see this because you, you know you can see how like uh, you know dynamic programming is like not just for optimizing recursion because like we saw like you know a lot of situations where like the naive recursive solution even for something simple like Fibonacci is exponential time. But if you optimize the recursion using dynamic programming, it becomes like linear. In some cases, it becomes quadratic, cubic, etc. But you know, like usually the recursion would be exponential time, ju just if you ran it as naive recursion. And now it's you know some kind of polynomial time. It's order n, order n squared, order you know m by n, whatever. But here we see kind of an example where like okay, we're not actually able to get this problem down to say like v squared or v cubed or any like polynomial using dynamic programming, but what we're able to do is we're able to like reduce the time complexity because you know the naive solution is just v, v factorial, but it fails to reuse information, right? Like the reason the solution is more efficient, we get a better time complexity, is because we successfully reuse some information. What information do we reuse? Well, there may be multiple pathways by which you reach the same state. Like, you, you might reach the same history of visited vertices, but from different places. Uh, and there, there we can have just a single solution for, you know, both of those branches of recursion and save a little bit on the time complexity, while still not being able to go below exponential time. <coughs>